Well, hello and welcome to RunJump Dev's December monthly meeting. Um, before we get started, we're gonna we're gonna talk about a little bit of upcoming stuff. We do have the holidays. We're gonna be taking a break. This is our monthly meeting, and instead of the end of the year, uh, normally or normally the end of the month, last Wednesday we'll have our meeting, but it's uh, mid month because of the holiday. And uh, our next event that you might be interested in coming out to is Global Game Jam. It's our largest event every year. Uh, it'll be held right here at the Bluegrass Community Technical College on uh, Newtown Pike. And it'll be a lot of fun. It's January 20th, 48 hours of uh, crazy team game building. Uh, it'll be a lot of fun. Come on out for that. We are happy to have Teddy Deef hailing us from Montreal. Uh, he is currently the uh, creative director at Square Enix Montreal. And you might remember uh, earlier this year, he re helped release a game, Hyper Light Drifter, uh, which was a release on PC and, and consoles. And he's going to talk to us about the menuing system there. It should be, should be pretty good. All right, Teddy, are you with us? I am. All right, take it away. Cool. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. This is a it's fun to get to talk about one's own things. I find it to be very educational for me to like take moments like this to talk about things. Um, so we released Hyperlight about, uh, oh gosh, almost nine months ago now for PC. Um, and what I want to focus on, well, I'll, I'll give a bit of an introduction to the game for those who are unfamiliar. Um, Hyperlight Drifter is, sort of a Zelda-like action RPG, um, and is set in this other otherly world, uh, in sort of a ruined place that you are exploring as this character, the Drifter, and you are trying to find a cure for uh, an illness that is killing you. Um, so it's a big game. We worked on it for about three years, and in the end, there was some, uh, about six months before that in pre-production and prototyping. Um, but one of the things that we decided early on um, was that we wanted to make this a game that had no words in it. Uh, we didn't want to use any text, we didn't want any dialogue in this particular game. Um, it was a decision that stemmed mostly from like a creative and art side. Uh, the two main artists on our project had worked together uh, in animation and um, uh, had produced this short film. This is just one example of something they'd done. They had produced this short film that they didn't finish, but they got it to a pretty far stage. Uh, and it was completely wordless. And we all watched it together while we were running the Kickstarter for this game, which is how it got funded. And we all really liked the vibe. And uh, Alex Preston, who was the, the creator of the game and uh, was doing all the art for the game, kind of wanted to go in this direction for, for Hyperlit as well. We thought, we know the story that we want to tell with this character, the Drifter. We know that, um, you know, generally what the look is going to be, the style developed a lot over time, but roughly speaking, we knew. Um, and so we thought, okay, like, we can make a game without words. We can use animation. So that's what this short film did. We can, we can convey motion, we can convey plot, with just the environment, because environmental storytelling is something that's very well proven in video games and is like a wonderful tool that we have. Uh, and we just think using music and animation and the, the art itself, we can convey everything we need to. We, we knew that the story wasn't very intricate. We knew that it, um, it has plenty of beats, but there's not, like, there's not a lot of interpersonal stuff happening. There's not a lot of, you meet very few recurring characters in the game. Um, and since that was like not a necessity that we had to have people talking things out or having complex situations, we just thought, cool, this is like, it's mostly a creative choice. Like you might consider it like a scope cut to not have to write dialogue, um, but it was primarily, it was made as a creative concern. Um, so what I want to talk to you all about um, and focus on with, with my brief time with you is the ramifications of that decision on one element of game design, which is our menus. Um, because here's the thing, uh, one of the values that we had in the production of this game 
in all aspects was attention to detail, which which sounds like very trite, right? Like yeah, of course you want to pay attention to detail, but the I think the creative nature of all of us on the team was such that we just really wanted we cared about the little things um, to perhaps an obsessive degree and sometimes to a dangerous degree. Um, but so when once we decided that we were going to make a wordless game, we we realized like as we got into development like. Mm, no one speaks any language in this game. There's no text in the world. There's no dialogue. The menus that you use as the drifter ideally shouldn't have language. Um, like, let's see if we can extend that to your entire experience inside of this world. Um, so I'm going to uh, hide my face and screen share with you. Um, and let's. I'm going to walk through some pieces of the game here as a visual aid and use the video game itself. Um, here we go. Hopefully you can see this video game. The frame rate's going to be a little slow, but that's OK. Awesome. Can you still hear me? I'm getting thumbs up. Sweet. OK, uh, I was, um, I was uh, collecting some things while I was talking to, to you just now. So I'm going to work back to the central area of the game, and I will show you what I meant by everything I just started to ramble about. It's going to teleport out here. I wish we had sound, but if it's not, I don't know how it's going to do. OK, um, so here I am in the central bit of town. Let's talk about, let's start from square one. Um, other characters, right? Uh, there's no dialogue. So um, I don't say anything. If I see other characters, I get a sense of who they are just kind of by their animation and what they're doing. Um, here's a little skeleton man playing the guitar. Uh, I'm not going to talk as much about this, but this was our solution for when we did need to tell something akin to dialogue. So we have these little boxes that pop up, much like a dialogue bubble. And we tell these three panel stories. It's the story of a guy and his pal who are saved by this other character that you get to know in the game. Uh, that is a little less important than what I'm going to talk about. That's kind of a fringe thing. But here we go. OK, so there aren't a lot of menus in the game. In fact, there are two, or two and a half. Let me show you what they are. Um, we start with this. This is uh, what we called your loadout. It is sort of your main inventory screen. There isn't a lot of inventory. Um, and I won't walk you through all the little pieces of it just now. But uh, primarily here, you'll see on the left, you can see the drifter, um, a, a larger illustration, as well as any skills I would have unlocked and the things that I'm carrying. Uh, and then on the right here, I have uh, a two box cursor that lets me select weapons if I've unlocked different weapons. OK. So um, I want to talk, I'm going to talk first and mostly about the store menu is one specific one, because I can't really walk through all the UI decisions. But I kind of just want to shed some light on uh, what a wonderful nightmare it was to tackle this challenge uh, by showing you everything that we needed to communicate. Okay. Um, so this is the loadout. We've taken a look at it. We get a kind of idea of my weapons up top right. On the left, I have the drifter. And then the bottom right, I have my money. Um, which accumulates as I collect the main currency of the game. So let's talk about shopkeepers. That's what I want to show you today. Um, I'm going to go into the shop. What shop is this? I don't know. There's no words. Uh, that was one thing we had to establish, of course, was iconography. Right? Iconography becomes massively important when you have no text. So we have something akin to text written on a sign here. but. It's not going to give me any information as a player. The only information I have are these icons. Uh, this is a sword. That's an easy icon to do. This is a little less easy. This is um, the dash shop. It's where you unlock dash skills. So the way that we indicated shops throughout the town, which is actually standard for an RPG or any game of shops, is these signs. So this is the medical shop. Let's go into the sword shop, and I'm going to get nitty gritty with the menu itself. Here I am in the shop. Um, I'm going to go over and talk to this guy. 
So of course, the first question, which we solved on a higher level, is how do I talk to this guy? Um, we actually, this, this was one area where we compromised. So I'll talk about compromise a little bit more, but um, I've already explained to the user how to use the Y button to interact with things. So this is the, um, this little box that's in front of me is the same box we use for every interaction in the game. Consistency was super important about this so that we only had to teach you once. Okay, so here's the interface. This is what I wanna talk about. And it's relatively simple compared to what I just showed you. Um, this is the menu for buying sword skills. Um, so, let's talk about individual messaging. The first thing that you need to know as a player is these are sword upgrades. This is what this shop is about, right? Um, we're actually already communicating that when you walk in, right? There's a guy here, um, I don't know how your fidelity is over there, but he's holding a sword, there's, he's spinning it around, he's showing sword techniques to this cute little guy. Um, there are swords on the wall, like the details of the shop is what we use to kind of establish, as well as the icon outside, that this is the sword shop. So cool, I'm in the sword shop. There's the vendor, he's holding a sword. Get it, sword shop. Um, number two, what is the upgrade going to do, right? Um, we thought about a lot of different ways to tackle this and ultimately just ended up on animated GIFs. Uh, technically, these are animated PNGs, but like, um, we just ended up with recordings. We thought about you know, how can we have him tell you what it's going to do? And this is actually a scope cut, because originally we thought about um, he's going to demonstrate it for you, and then you're going to get to try it out in a playground. We thought it would be best for players to get to try out a skill before they buy it. Um, for a lot of reasons, but primarily for scope reasons, we decided against that because in order to teach you how to use a skill, we have to communicate even more things. We have to communicate, um, this is a, like we have to leave the menu, we have to tell you this is a skill you can buy. And we have to somehow tell you, we're going to give it to you temporarily, but take it away, right? Whole, whole other set of challenges we didn't want to deal with. So question number two, what is the skill going to do? We just decided to show you and see if you could just get an idea for it. So this is a sword attack. Um, the other thing we added here was input. So we, we try to teach you how to use the skill because again, we didn't have the scope to like have someone really instruct you. So you're gonna buy a thing and then you're gonna leave the shop. And then if you don't know how to use it, like, what happened to the money I just spent? I just spent all this money and oh man, like what did I get? So we had to demonstrate it and put the button bumps in. So you'll see under the animation is a filling X button, which thankfully is like um, a video game standard that we could take advantage of, something that people we were hoping would understand. Um, so this one is just the X button, and we use a animated GIF again to show there are bullets coming at you. Those are bullets. If you've played, if you've been playing the game already. You know those are bullets, and there you are hitting them with your sword. Cool. Also, you'll see the icon that I have selected uh, on the left here, uh, which Alex iterated on many times, is kind of a bullet deflecting off of a thing. And those are the only tools we have to tell you what you've bought and how to use it. We didn't have time or scope to do anything else, so we had to do it all with this one screen. Uh, this is the third skill, which is super complicated to explain. The usage of it is very nuanced, and thankfully, or as a result of us having no text in the game, um, part of the aesthetic of Hyperlight Drifter is about mystery. And so uh, we were fortunate and also intentional in having some parody there. Like, to have a game like ours, which is about secrets, which is about exploring the world and figuring things out, we released a demo uh, about a year or more, a year and a half before full release. And one of the feedback items that we heard was that people liked that we weren't telling them everything, that we weren't holding their hand through the entire game. They, they even had to figure out some of the controls. So that was sort of part of the compromise decision here is we thought, hey, we actually don't want to tell them exactly what's going on here. Like, um, we don't want to tell them uh, how much damage this attack does. They're just going to figure it out. Um, but, but uh, I, I won't go too off on a tangent here, but 
Um, you'll see how many of these decisions are linked together because another thing is that our menus then influence as a way, uh, by, by way of not being able to have text is the fundamental numbers for the combat of the game. Uh, because we weren't having text, because we didn't have numbers, uh, how we display HP is super limited. Um, uh, also, the pixel resolution of the game isn't super high. It's intentionally pixelated. So if you look at, um, let me see if I can do this. My uh, little UI up in the top left, my HUD, um, that's the information that we have to show you about the drifter and how much health the drifter has. Um, so you've got these green pips, which represent your health. And each one of these pips, I believe, is four pixels wide. Is that right? One, two, three, maybe uh, six pixels wide. So if you add all that up in the space that we allocated for the UI, that is 30 plus four. It's about 34 to 40 pixels that we have. Um, so that only allows you so much fidelity. Um, and I won't, I won't ramble, uh, but what I'm trying to point out here is that because we knew we weren't going to have text, and we knew that we didn't have a lot of fidelity to show like, meters and bars that had a lot of nuance, um, we kept enemy HP low. So if you think about skill menus in a video game that you might have played, like uh, that has upgrades like Dishonored or something, or Skyrim, right? Uh, when you look at the skill menu, it's going to tell you if you unlock this skill, it's going to give you 15% upgrade on your attack. That's not something that we could do um, because, A, we can't say it to you. And the only way you can understand that really in a game like that is for it to just straight up tell you. Uh, and B, we just, we don't have the, we don't have the fidelity. Like we, we wanted to keep everything simple so that it was simple to communicate. So enemies, by and large, have somewhere between 1 and 5 HP. There's no uh, 1,000 HP or you're doing 900 damage. We, we shrunk all our numbers down. Um, it also meant that we cut and cut and cut our skill list. We wanted upgrades. We want the player to be able to buy things. But when you don't have granularity, when you can't just tell the player, hey, this is going to give you 10% more strength, and this attack's going to give you 15% more speed, and this one's going to give you another 15% more speed. When you don't have that level of detail with words, um, you can't give those upgrades because the, the players don't totally understand them. And so we simplified. We cut, cut, cut in a way that the combat worked and kept it simple. So there are only three sword skills. There's no strong attack, super strong attack, upgrade your super strong attack again. There's just this heavy attack that does two damage instead of one. Uh, there's this bullet deflect, which has no granularity, it just deflects bullets, it just does a new thing. And we have this sort of what we call a phantom slash, which is a multiple enemy slash dash. And that's it. We cut everything else because anything else we came up with didn't do a new thing. It wasn't different enough. Um, and because we did that, to pull it back to the menu now, uh, we could show these with just GIFs because each one is does a very different thing. Um, so let me get back to the details of the menu. Uh, we have established that this is the sword shop. We have established that the upgrade that we're going to buy deflects bullets. But we need to establish that there are other upgrades. This is something I've already walked you through, so at this point you understand. Um, but it's just a UI design thing. Um, we had to make three identical boxes with three similar icons to show you that you could even move the cursor because we don't have a lot of menus in the game. So we don't have a lot of time to teach you what your controller does in this menu. And nowhere in this menu does it say, like, do we have a D-pad that shows you can scroll up and down. So it's just something that we have to hope that the player does. Um, and you'll see we created this line work to, you know, we have a highlight box. Not, not super uh, complicated, but something that we have to consider. Number four, um, there are more upgrades than what you see here. Okay, so I talked earlier about how this is the sword shop, uh, but the point of establishing that this is the sword shop is that it is different from other shops, that there are other shops. Um, the way we're communicating that is in two ways. First of all, here I am in the town. 
Can we run back up to that shop? I can't see this shop without seeing another shop. Okay, so the mo the, this layout is such that the moment I notice, hey, there's a thing I can go into, I also notice, hey, there's another thing that I can go into. So that's the first hint from this perspective that you're going to be able to buy other things, right? Because we want to let players know, hey, you can shop around, you have options. The second major way that we do this is with the loadout menu that I showed you before. Um, it may or may not be difficult to see with the screen sharing, but if you look on the left, you see the icon of the drifter. Let me get away from the stores so you can see that more clearly. You see the icon of the drifter, and then you see on the drifter's left, there are three boxes that are faint, and there are three boxes on the right, and then there's two boxes below. That's important because what we ended up doing for the menu in the sword shop is, is actually duplicating. It's the same code, it's the same assets. That menu. Here's those three boxes. However, because we needed to simplify, we need to not distract you, we had to get rid of the other boxes. So there are no other boxes here. So this menu cannot tell you there are other shops, except by, like I said, having you already walked in and seen that there was another shop. But we're hoping that you recognize, and we found that players did when we play tested, that yeah, there are other things you can upgrade elsewhere. Okay, this is just the sword stuff. Another small detail you'll notice here uh, is on the Drifter's illustration, there is a white box highlighting the sword. It's not super loud because it's not the most important thing that you need to know when you look at the screen, but it's there. It's a little pulsing box that says, hey, you're upgrading the sword. If I were to go next door, to the dash shop. Very similar menu, uh, but that highlight is now on the foot. So this is your dash tech. These are all dash related skills. And again, they each have their own animation. Um, so I'll just stay in the shop. I'm going to move on. Uh, here's the next one, and yo, this one is hard. Um, you will spend money on this. You might think that that's uh, pretty self-explanatory, but it can be kind of scary when you think about uh, anything that's going to make your player frustrated is like the worst thing. It's like the worst feeling as a designer is to feel like, oh, my lights are going off. Uh, the worst feeling is to feel like your player is going to be angry or frustrated or otherwise not happy. Um, not because of like challenge, but because something didn't work like they expected it to. So we need to be super clear that this is a shop, that you're about to spend your money, and that this stuff is money. Because you're picking up stuff in the game, and it, um, like it's not dollar bills. It's like little golden cubes. It's these cubes that, uh, these squares that you see next to my cursor. Um, So this is, yeah, it's kind of, um, this is where it gets complicated. We did a lot of iterations on this. Here are the things that go into telling you exactly what the transaction is that's happening here. Um, here are skills. Next to my cursor, we have three gold icons. Okay. Um, what does that mean? Is that even a number of things? There's lots of little bleeps and bloops in this UI. Um, how do I know that that's important and what that means? Okay, that is the same icon that we use in the box on the bottom right. That's my money. And this is this might seem like I don't know if this seems uh, mundane or unnecessary detail to you all, but trust me, in the test that we did, that was not immediately, it was not just clear by default, right? Like we had to make sure that you knew what the hell was going on. Because there's no one to tell you, hey, this is your money. Um, and most of this comes down to simplicity, because again, the solution doesn't look very complicated. It's just about visual clarity. Um, but once again, as we've done before, we tried to minimize the number of things you have to learn. So if I show you the loadout again, there's a loadout menu. There's that same box in almost exactly the same position. So all we did to create the store menu was take things away from the inventory menu. Otherwise, it's exactly the same, um, which for me, because I built this menu, was a great relief and also a, a convenient scope choice. 
Um, we definitely tried menus that were different than the shopkeepers. And what it meant was that the moment you walked into a shopkeeper, you had to start from scratch. Anything that you learned about the menu was worthless because this was a brand new menu. So instead, let's reuse the same one. So we get rid of these weapon selections because they're irrelevant to the store. And we just keep the skills you're going to unlock. That same drifter that hopefully you recognize from your loadout menu and your money. So you know, OK, that's that box. That, uh, the other thing that you'll notice that I, I can't show you because I'm just standing in a store, but when I pick up money, uh, a box appears above my head to show me that I've gotten money, and it's this same box, the box at the bottom right. So we just reuse the assets, we reuse the exact same shape, the exact same color and iconography, so that repetition, repetition, you know what this is. Cool. So now I know this is a dash shop, I know what this skill does, sort of, and I know that it costs money. And I know that it costs three monies because I've got three icons next to the cursor that I'm going to spend, and I've got three icons down on the bottom right. Uh, in this particular case, um, we have to communicate that you don't have enough money. That's another thing we have to deal with now. It's like, okay, cool. How do we tell them whether or not they have enough? Because this, it's it's not quite numbers, so we have to make sure that they understand the idea of insufficient funds or negative. You know. um, this is primarily done just through the color red, which thank God for for human language and, and visual language. Like People understand that red means bad, red means stop, red means no. So we just use that established language um, to say, yeah, but you don't have enough. Uh, and in this case, you'll see since I actually have zero money, there's three dots flashing. If I were to have one money, uh, there would be one golden one and then two red flashing. Uh, if I were to have four money, it would be uh, four gold, but three of them would be highlighted. So, so this, this is how I know. The other thing that we do that you won't be able to hear is that if I try to buy it, um, it kind of flashes uh, in an angry way, and it makes a very unpleasant sound. <laughs> so scare people away uh, with sound. Um, Last thing is what button do I push? This, this is like a standard video game thing, and I'm hoping that I'm talking a lot about how our game has no words and how that was a challenge for us. But what's important to realize here is that like, these are considerations for any video game or, or any interface, really. Like I'm, I'm not a full-time professional interface designer or web designer, but these are all the sort of mental processes that those designers go through as well. Um, so this isn't unique to our game as having no language. It's just that we have to be extra clear and extra sparse and extra obvious. Because if you don't get it, you're stuck. There's no, there's no tutorial. There's no person that will tell you exactly what to do. Um, this is a situation where uh, this is one of the compromises we made, which you may have seen before. We're technically using button icons here. Technically, the in the bottom right, you see A and B. Technically, that's a, that's a letter, so we're using language. And that was, in our value system for this game, a compromise. Like, oh, we, we thought about using color, and if you're using an Xbox controller, it's a green button and a red button. Um, in this case, I have an Xbox controller plugged in, so it is displaying the A and B icons. But we found that the color wasn't enough. You have to say A and B. So we made a compromise, and we put letters in. Um, and then we just use standard check marks. Um, we also uh, were forced to change the input of the game. Uh, this is another situation where the menus, although we did them later on in development, actually changed the way that combat played for the rest of the game. This was a decision we made several weeks before release. So I'm going to tell you a story about this, and then uh, I'm going to wrap up my deep, deep uh, obsessive discussion of this menu. Originally, the inputs for the controller um, and I'm going to actually switch back so I can get up in your face about this. Hi. Here's a controller. Sweet. Video games. Um, we have four face buttons. We wanted to use as few buttons as possible, but sure enough, by the end of production, we used all four. Um, a is your dash. This is pretty obvious, um, at least for us. Like, uh, it's a very common button for movement. Uh, in Bastion, it's the roll button. 
in Mario, it's the button in roughly this position is the jump button. So okay, we know this is dash. We've got three other buttons. Um, the other actions on the controller that you use are your sword. This also was sort of locked. We thought, okay, like this is the hit, this is the do stuff button. This is the punch button in fight games. Um, you know, in a in an old NES game with jump and punch, this one's usually jump. This one's usually punch. Um, so let's pretend, at least for our sakes, these two buttons were locked down. Here's two more buttons. Um, for a long time, we weren't sure. We knew one of them was going to be weapons, um, or we thought one of them was going to be weapons. Well, here's the, here's the important thing. For a long time, we wanted the interact button. We have an interact button. So if ever I want to talk to a shopkeeper, if ever I want to select something or open a door, I need a button to push. A is already taken. Okay, like the green button that says select is already taken. We can't use that in the world. Um, so we had this two case situation where if you're playing in the world, if you're running around, uh, we need a different button for interact because we tried overriding the dash. We tried making it so that if you walk up to someone and you want to talk to them, you push this button and it talks to them instead of dashing. But people found that frustrating, uh, that it didn't do what they expected it to, that it didn't do what it did before. So suddenly, we can't use this green button. Um, so we thought, OK, let's use B as select. Because why doesn't, like for us, we're like, well, why does it make sense to select? Why is like, I don't know, it's like a menu button or swap weapons. It's something, it's something less important. Because if you're holding a controller, your thumb is down here. Like it's the one furthest away. Uh, we don't want that. So let's make interact B. So for most of production, this is the button for interact with things. The red cancel button <laughs> was interact. But it made sense to us because it was close. It was as close as we could get. Um, late in the game, as we were uh, trying to finalize the UI, we found that we had this massive, horrible, horrible problem, which is that I just explained to you the constraints of why the screen button is dash. This is not select. And we could only pick from these two for select. I picked the closer one. Uh, however, we found that once we went into a menu, all that people wanted to do was see what they always did when they see a menu. Um, which is, yo, A is select and B is cancel in every video game ever, right? A is select, B is cancel, or you know, for whatever controller. So that what they would do is they would use the B button to interact. They'd open the menu, and then push the B button again, and it would close the menu. And so that was very confusing to players. So what we ultimately did, as you might imagine, and by this menu, is that we decided Huh, let's make trying. Let's make the Y button, that button that I said we didn't want to use as a main action. Let's let's give in and make that select. So the way that I select something is not by using the sword. The dash still dashes. Um, it's by using the Y button. So we moved it to Y, and that solved our problem that we were struggling against. So now we could have A as select and B as cancel. Um, one thing that we did as a compromise was that uh, you, you won't really be able to see this. I wish I could show you my hands at the same time. But the problem we just solved was that one button did opposite things, right? The Y button, or, or uh, when the B button was interact, it would open the menu. And then if I press it again, it closes the menu. And that was frustrating because people thought it was the select button. So now that Y is interact, um, in the menu system, it tells you that A is select and B is cancel. But Y actually, if you look in the bottom right, you can see uh, I'm pushing the Y button, or I'm pushing the A button that says select. That's not true. I'm actually pressing the Y button. So we doubled the functionality secretly so that if people decided that they wanted to still use Y, the button that they used to get into this menu, it would still work. Um, I hope that that makes sense. Let me recap because, oh man, I'm saying so many words. Four buttons. So what we ended up with is in the menus, to get to the menu, you use this. This doesn't do anything, at least in this situation. Um, once you get into the menu, this is select, this is cancel, and this is also select because you just use it to select. And that was sort of the compromise we came up with. We tried Y and B, and it, it also confused people because all anyone ever wants to do is select and cancel. Every video game they've ever played tells them to do that. And so we were like slaves to the tradition of 
video games because we didn't have words to tell people otherwise. I'm going to stop there. That's a lot of words about menus. Um, anybody have any questions? So the few places in the game that you did ultimately end up using text, there are a few of them. Like, I know when you first start the game, you pick up the pistol and it's like, hit stuff to charge your gun, things like that. Yeah. Uh, at what point in testing were you like, okay, these are the places that we're going to use text, this is the compromise we're going to make? Yeah, yeah. Um, I should have skipped over that part. Um, thankfully, we started tutorials early enough uh, at the at the suggestion of one of our, our level design level designers, Lisa Brown, who used to work at Insomniac, um, she shipped a lot of games, and she was like, "Yo, you guys, you have to do tutorials because um, you think you're not going to have to use text, but you, you that's going to create so much work for you." And so, um, actually, let me let me show you as an example to answer your question. I'm going to screen share again. Let's do the thing. Let's quit. 15 minutes since last save. Sure. I'll lose my progress. That's actually a super side note. Uh, it just warned me that it's been 15 minutes since the game autosaved. The reason is that the game never autosaves inside of the store. One of the safety mechanisms, mechanisms we put in to prevent player frustration is that uh, we wouldn't say it until you left the store. So if you bought something and you used the money that probably took you like an hour to get um, or more, uh, you wouldn't accidentally buy something you didn't like. So at least maybe you get a chance to try it while you're still standing in the shop. We just waited a moment. Uh, okay, let's start a new game and I'll show you the tutorial example. Uh, my name is Red. So what we did in the tutorialization is we tried to create scenarios that force you to use things. Right? That's like the, the best way to teach someone how to do something is to force them to do it. That's like the, I don't know, best way to teach someone how to fly is push them out of a plane. Not a great example. But. <laughs> Oh wait, I just I skipped the tutorial. I just skipped it. Um, this is one of the ones that I, we didn't, I don't think we used text, unless I'm wrong. Uh, let's, let's go back. We're going to go back. I'm going to give you a 10 minute answer to a 30 second question. OK, my name is Weg. All right, let's try that again. So this is the beginning of the game. You don't know anything about the game or how to play it. I'm skipping the cutscene. So yeah, um, we were hoping you just figure everything out, right? So like movement, we don't have to tell you how to move because people will just try the stick. So cool, we're good on that one. Um, next thing that we, I believe, didn't teach was dashing, but I'll get to that in a second. Here we block you with some bushes. So you're going to have to get through them. Like, you know you have to get through them because there's a box that you want. It's green, and there's so much empty space, and oh, man, that's the only place I can go. So what players are going to do is push the buttons. Ha, ah, I just had a cheat, and I skipped through it. Um, but, like, mostly players are going to push all these buttons, and they're not going to do anything. Most of the buttons are, like, not useful yet. So ultimately, they're going to push this sword button. So they just learned how to slash. So that one we got away with for free because we thought, okay, that's easy enough. Um, same thing happens here. This is a dead end. Um, this is sort of a case where we just decided to cut our losses and be careful. Um, but this isn't really the one that forced us to use text. But here it says hold Y to interact. Um, we were a little worried that people wouldn't understand the concept of a long press. Um, that's something that's relatively new in video games. It's like last few years more you uh, use the idea of holding a button down. Um, we wanted to make sure they knew they had to hold the button. And it just came down to play tests. It was like, well, even if this is working, even if people are figuring it out, um, if 1 in 20 doesn't figure it out, we're ruined, because this is so basic um, that you know we care a lot about keeping the text simple. But at the end of the day, 
we just want people to be able to play the game and let's let's kind of um, let's not be jerks about it. Let's not be like too stubborn. Um, here's the one that was the, maybe one of the scariest was a uh, a gun. Um, uh, for a number of reasons, we ended up putting the gun on the triggers, which are like if you're playing a video game that looks pixelated and Zelda-ish, like you're not really thinking about using the triggers like you would use a normal gun. Um, I'm picking up a gun. It tells me I have a gun now, and hopefully I notice. Hopefully the player noticed that they have a gun, and now they're standing here. And this is kind of where we decided we needed to use text. It's like, cool, we're going to create a gap, and the puzzle here. A very simple puzzle is there is a switch. We're teaching you how to do two things at once. We're teaching you that there are switches that activate things and that you can shoot them to activate them. Um, but with but man, like we just didn't see people in every playtest figuring out that the triggers would do anything, or they weren't even thinking about them. They're just using the face buttons. And so what happens if they don't know is they're gonna walk around, they're gonna be like, oh crap, they're gonna try to dash across, they're gonna take damage. And then the worst thing that ever happens is they'll go backwards. They'll be like, I'm in the wrong room, and they would just leave. In the first minute of the game, we're, like the priority is just to establish mood and just to get through the, the introduction and some of the basic storytelling. It just wasn't worth it. Like We could have assumed that players would figure out, oh, I can aim with the left trigger, and I can shoot with the right. Um, but at the end of the day, it was just, it, like we, we could have released without these, but we decided to be nice to our players in this one circumstance before we punish them for the rest of the game. <laughs> uh, okay, well, is there anyone else? I have Yeah. As, as our next question is coming up, I'll supplement by saying one of the other things that made us feel better about adding text here is that we had to add text because PlayStation and Sony require, or Sony and Microsoft require it. Like there are, um, there are basic fundamental things when it comes to like uh, menus that you just have to have. Like for example, um, I won't restart the game, but you have to say, this is an icon that you will see whenever the game is saving data. Please do not unplug your console while this is saving. You have to introduce that concept and you have to use text or you can't pass certification. So knowing that, knowing that we'd have to have some sort of like title screen um, that would give you a couple basic things they needed, like I, I forget which ones were required, but there are certain settings that are also required. Like um, I forget if like like I don't know if it's brightness, but maybe certain sound options have to be required. There just have to be some things that you give people. Um, so we were like, oh, okay, well we have to put text in. So um, at least with tutorials, the compromise that we made is that. Um, the only time you see English language fed to you is when it's technically non-diegetic. Uh, I think that's mostly a film term, but it means like text that doesn't exist in the world. This menu doesn't exist in the world. This is not like um, th there's no animation where the drifter pulls up like a tablet and he's looking at this. Um, the tutorials are like whispers from the designer that they like fade into screen space. Um, everywhere else, like the shopkeeper menu, that we felt was in the world. You went up and pushed a button and talked to a a character in the world, and the immediate responses to this came up. So that one, we felt like we could use text just to clarify, like where we do the line. The end. Awesome. Oh, that makes sense. What you just said that's really interesting. How you thought about that. Um, by the way, my name's Leonard. How are you, Teddy? Hi, I'm doing well. Thanks. It's cold here. Um, yeah, it's cold up here too. <laughs> oh, and that's anyway too. Um, I'm sorry. My, my question is that you were saying that you had to cut a lot of things in the game and everything um, be, because of your focus not to have text. Mm -hmm. What was the one thing that you wanted so badly that you had to cut because of that? Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's maybe two things. Like this is a really really high level one, but um, we ended up. Uh, reducing focus on characters in the game even more than we did originally. Like we had more characters in the game to start that you would interact with, who you would meet along the way, to be all these different NPCs with little stories. Um, but because our solution was more expensive than text, because we couldn't just have someone you walk into and they go, oh, like, 
I hurt my foot today. And like, that's the conversation or whatever. Like, like, because someone can't just tell you something. Um, like there's a dude that I talked to in town that says, oh, this thing attacked us and then this guy saved us. Like, I just told you a really basic story in, in like eight seconds and I, you know, I could write that text and put it in the game in eight seconds, but we had to do story panels that are really expensive that take the artists like a week uh, or more when it comes to iteration to make sure that it's like doing its job. So we had to cut the number of characters. So there's only one real town in the game. Uh, there's only one real NPC that tells you a story per region, roughly. Like on average, is like one character who has a story to tell you. There was more, um, and ultimately we decided like um, let's we're going to make the world more centralized. We're going to focus on this one town in the center of the world and not have more characters out in the world. Uh, and it ends up kind of like. Uh, fortunately, what that means, or what you try to do, is not make it feel like a cut. So, uh, as a consequence, the world outside was outside of the central area was designed to be more dead, to have like less society, um, and it ended up working pretty well with the way the story was anyway. That like everyone who was still a member of civilization was mostly holed up in this last city in the center of the world. Um, so, not having text in the game indirectly made our world uh, more. More ruined. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. So, for the game without text, how come you ended up creating an entire language for it then? Like the, the encoded text, all those uh -huh. symbols? Uh, it's like, yeah, go ahead. No, it's like, uh, was that important for like the just the feeling of the world? Did you want to have these symbols that represented what looked like written text, or how much time was spent on that? Because I know Alex said something about he wanted to make it more complicated than what you ultimately had, because he was a little disappointed in how quickly people translated it. Yeah, well, that's the internet, you know. Um, like, uh, it's it's hard to make a secret, but that lasts a really long time. I forget how long it took the internet to figure out the language. This is a, spo a mild spoiler, I guess. It's not a story spoiler, but um, I'm wondering if I can, where is the nearest one and can I get to it to show you? Uh, yes, I can show you something. Um, I can't tell it worked. Oh, you're looking at me, not the video game. Hang on, I'm just going to load my save Fred. To get to one of the monoliths, or I'm just gonna go to the town because I'll, I'll show you. Um, there is language here. Uh, here we go. Boop. Yeah. So this wasn't so much a, a compromise. It's like um, we had a lot of discussion about this, uh, which is like, what does it mean to have no language in the game, or uh, a wordless game, or a textless game? Because nobody talks. Um, they communicate through pictorials. This is that thing I was referencing back. Um, but it is a society. Like, they build buildings. They sell things. They have a currency. Um, so, like, they probably do talk, right? Like, um, these bubbles don't exist in the world. Like, this guy isn't holding up a giant painting. Like, this is a this is a outside of the video game representation. Outside of the world, right? Like the drifter as a character is not seeing the same image that we're seeing. So we kind of agreed on that. that like, okay, these people are talking, but the experience of the game is just not going to have language. Um, so, like, there are, like, Alex from the beginning was putting text into the game, but it was fake. It was like garbage, garbly stuff. Like, uh, the signs above the doors originally, that was just like little greebles. Um, early on, the menus have all these little greebles too, which like um, makes sense because a lot of what you're doing is discovering old technology. And if there's technology, there's probably math, and there's probably you know science and communication. So they've got they've got words, they've got a written language. We're just not going to bother teaching it to you, and it doesn't matter. So there's all these greebles. So we got to a point where we were like, well, um, what is more important? to us than being sticklers about like no language at all. It's like, uh, let's, ma let's make an alphabet. Let's actually write things in an alphabet that are cohesive. So, um, so that's kind of where we started with the alphabet. 
is like, um, we actually were not in a unanimous agreement about this, to be honest. Uh, I, I, I liked it. Um, there were people on the team who wanted to be more holistic about like there's literally no text or there's no language, but technically in our video game, there is translatable English language if you figure out the, the alphabet. Um, that was just something that like I, I was kind of into because I wanted to make a cipher. I was really hyped about making a cipher, even though it's not a very complex one. Like uh, I didn't expect it to take the internet that long because I'm not a cryptologist. Uh, neither was Alex. So, like basically, I had an idea for the the alphabet, um, which I guess I shouldn't say because it's kind of a spoiler. Like. It's based on like the, the way an alphabet in a different language language works, and I was like, let's just do one to one cipher, um, and let's build something. Uh, so I don't know. You, you like you win some, you lose some. Like we lose a little bit of credibility that technically there's no words in the game, but what we get is a little bit more depth, and we wanted to reward super deep players, right? Like understanding that that's an alphabet doesn't matter, and even though the internet figured it out, I don't know. Probably ninety five percent of people who play the video game will never know that. Um, so it's kind of like a, we wanted it, the ability to give a special treat to our players who really, really want to get deep into it. So yeah, let's hide some language because for everyone else who plays the game, it's not going to break the experience. It's not going to feel like there's English language. It's invisible to them. Hey. Uh, uh, you, I'm glad you have a, an alphabet in your game. It reminds me a little bit of the old Commander Keen games uh, where mm. the Bogons had their own. Um, but I was wondering when you're developing a system, when you're developing specifically a menu system and trying to work off of a non-text basis to get information across, did you have references you were looking at, other games in the past that you were inspired by or you, that you would point to and say, like, if you're looking for, for ideas, like, mm. that's where to go? Um, a little bit. Like, uh, I would say... The relation, so I didn't really talk about the working process for for this, but um, we looked at some stuff like you know we looked at other RPGs and their we looked at Final Fantasy VI um, as a reference for like cool here's like a menu system that the Final Fantasy games adopted that by and large like they stuck with um, what are they communicating here and how are they communicating it. Um, I think that helped us to break down some of the problems. Like I was saying, like these problems are like these questions of what questions do you need to answer for the player? What am I buying? Am I using my money? How much of my money am I using? All that stuff you do have to answer in every video game. So it helped us to see what they were communicating, but it didn't really necessarily help us. Um, like at best, it, it taught us what are they communicating, and how can we not do it the same way? Um, and then perhaps what are some things that we can can keep. So for example, like uh, I'm going to forget because I don't have it in front of me, but I think that in FF6, oh, my lights are going out. I think that in FF6, um, I have a motion sensor that I have to leave. The gill that you spend was in the bottom right. Like we found that that was not universal, but common enough that we're like, okay, we're going to put our currency in the bottom right of the menu. So that's actually something that we took from other games, even though it looks really different in ours. Um, but then most of the working process was like um, Alex would look at visual reference and then put a menu together and then it was kind of like a writer editor relationship a lot of the time. Like he'd try a mock up and then I, and then I'd be like, I don't understand what this means. I don't understand what this means because um, uh, like he would do a lot of visual study because he was an artist and I would do a lot of design response because I'm like a, a, by trade at that point like a game designer like experienced designer, so I could walk through it for him and be like, here's all the things I don't understand right now, and then we'd solve them together by like him sketching and pointing at things and figure it out. Cool. Thanks. Since you're not using text and you're not naming things officially, do things have an official name? How did you communicate, like, oh, you know, that one particular enemy, or what do, what do we call these items? Some are named through the achievements. I don't know if that was just like a, a side effect or unintentional, but like, uh, yeah, there. Um, in general, like we we decided at some point, um, like in general, we learned where to pick our battles, and so. 
we probably thought a few times, like, oh, let's think about what we're going to name these, but then we're like, it's just faster to name them stupid things because no one's going to know. So, like, we don't have, we don't push our own names for them. Everything does have a name for the development team, but, like, many of them are not good names. Like, they're just there because they communicate to us what it is. Like, uh, the internal name, which you can probably figure out because it's in the build, it's in, like, the assets for the game, but, like, the northern boss is, like, this um, sort of, like, large bird-like cult person. We just call him the Jerk Pope. But, like, Jerk Pope is, like, a stupid name that, we, like, we would come up with something more artistic, but we didn't have to because it didn't matter. So it's a kind of, like, a, a work process go cut of, like, naming things, giving things good names is hard, let's not worry about it. So, yes, everything has a name, but whenever some people have asked us, like, oh, what's the name for this character? We're like, what do you think? And that, like... A lot of the names that are in the wiki for major characters are not what we call them, but like, they're good. They're fine. They're better than what we use. So. Thanks, fans. That people have come and found humorous or was really different or unexpected? Oh, for names? Um, I mean, the, one of the biggest characters is the... Uh, this other drifter that who like rescues you. He's actually the one that is in that story panel, um, which here, I'll show you for those of you who aren't familiar. Blue, blue. It's right here. Uh, this character um, is in the game a lot, and the community first started calling calling them. Uh, Pink Drifter, they just like calling them like our, our early fans who were following the game before at least called called it Pink Drifter. And then I think now the wiki calls it the Guardian. Um, we always like we always called it the badass drifter because like in practice that's what it was. Like that was the verb. That was the only pillar that was like an early pillar for it. It's like it's gonna be really whenever you see them do something, it's gonna be really impressive. And like when the, the first time you hear a story about them, it's them saving the day. So that is not at all a name that we wanted to propagate, and if that ended up on the wiki, I'd be really sad because it's totally not the canonical name. It's just our garbage name. Um, John's typing up an Imgur link. Uh, one of the things I did when playing the game was I tried to collect all the gear bits without spending them because mm -hmm. I noticed there's like a finite amount of space for it, <laughs> and. I give you credit. You did double the space once I capped it out, but it it does keep going. So yes. Was that something? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Again, that was like a um, a long game question, which is like uh, that's this menu here. Yeah. Uh, here, God, that that window. So okay, here's why we did this. Um, Oh, I have to get out of this menu. Okay. How do I get this video game? Uh, yeah, the window at the bottom right starts to like, accumulate these little things. Um, we couldn't use numbers. And a few times, Alex mocked up numbers and, and wanted to use numbers because he was so sick of doing iterations on this. Like this, this window in itself is the thing that almost drove us to using numbers in the game because Alex was so tired of doing iterations on this, but the, um, you're not going to be able to see it right now because I don't have enough currency, but the problem we ran into is how do we differentiate the different things you collect. So there is the money in the bottom right, and then on this other screen, top left, there's the modules, which are like the main thing you collect to progress in the game, and then uh, top right are these keys um, for like doors you can unlock. And so we gave them each a different color. Um, the modules are pink because they're, that's the most important color in the game. The keys are green, because green means go, green means go forward, and the money is gold. Uh, the money used to be green, but we decided to make it gold so that the keys could be green. Um, but we were using color, but we also wanted to use shape. And so, again, like there isn't, there aren't, there isn't that much pixel space in that window. Like I think this window in the bottom right is maybe 120 pixels, and that's being generous. Um, so, like, if you make an icon and you're, you need to fit, like, 20 of them, 
you just start doing the math and you're like, oh god, like we need at least eight or sixteen pixels to make an icon that's going to look different. So they have to be a certain size. Um, so the compromise was, let's just use icons. If you keep collecting them, we'll expand the window like we did. And then, honestly, you'll have to remind me, like, can you get beyond that window with the number of gear bits? I think you can. Yeah. Uh, there should be a chat. You can click on the link that John sent. Oh, uh, yeah. And with that one, uh, there are certain gear bits that you need to have the multi-dash to get, which cost three gears. Mm -hmm. So if you did it again, and on New Game Plus, you'd have that, so I'm going to try it sometime. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, I think they probably still live at that point, and it, uh, what we decided then, again, is like, dude, forget it. Like, if you're going to do that, and you're going to go through and play New Game Plus, and like, really, really max it out, that's such an edge case that we didn't want to compromise the size of the icons, or the size of the window for the point of, you know, the whatever percent you, you will be, though you'll be the 1% or less of people who actually do that. And so we favored the 99%, we favored, like, um, let's, let, let's have them spill over Just the like, end of the day. Yeah, it's such an edge case, let's like, let it spill. It's like, let's save ourselves. Uh, so, I see you talked some about how the lack of words affected the, um, the way you ended up designing the setting and whatnot, I was curious on uh, some of the narrative on like how the uh, how you worked around uh, getting the uh, telling the story you wanted to tell without the words, and, and on uh, if that ever caused you to have s or you, you what know, some of the obstacles were on that um, to telling mm -hmm. some of the stories. So, yeah, you know, as for me, my experience playing it, notice that uh, some of the kind of little little area sub stories seem to kind of contrast to the broader story in terms of um, that that nuance that the broader story had. It felt like the smaller ones lacked, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I was like, yeah, how maybe that things like that were influenced by uh, lack. Of words, yeah. Um, I think like they were very indirectly influenced because uh, I guess fortunately, since we made the decision pretty much right at the beginning of proper production, like we made that decision when the Kickstarter was over, to use no text. Um, uh, that's just the way we were thinking from the beginning. So we never really had like a version of the storytelling that used text. So it was hard to get. Like I mean, there's a lot of detail that is lost in the lore that like uh, Alex and, and Casey Hunt spent a lot of time on. Um, but there was never like, oh, we, we planned on doing something that we super couldn't. But, but I would say like in terms of nuance that we did still have to scope down the story panels uh, to just three. Like a lot of them started much higher, like at like five, or that there were times where there were stories we wanted to tell that would take more images, and we just didn't have enough. So, uh, it, uh, even the stories that remained uh, were super scoped down. Like the story of the East got like redone a number of times because there were just too many beats to it, and like the way that the world was set up was just too complex. Um, and it wasn't that complicated, but it's like, well, um, the trouble with our game. God, I, I talk about this forever, but I'll try to just take a minute. Um, it's about you going around a ruined world. So there's two things happening in every area. There's the story of what's happening right now, and there's the story of what happened in the past. Um, and mostly that's told through like the environment is telling the story of the past, and the characters who are still living are telling the story of the present. It's, uh, but the environment also has to tell the story of the present. So like, you can't have a lot of nuance. Like the, um, so yeah, you're right. Like the. The NPC stories, the the side quests, so to speak, like the why, the, what, who the, for example, like who the bosses are and what their deal is, uh, is like kind of complex. But we just kind of hope that people could like figure out their own explanations for them. And um, I think at the end of the day, that like what shines through in anything that you make is that you always want to have more beneath the surface than what you bring to the top, right? Like. 
that's true when an actor creates a character and they work with the writer, right? Like there's so much backstory that gets written. There's so much work that the actor does establishing like what's my character like? What's my fa character's favorite food? Oh, they like pizza, but they don't like sausages. That's like a really neurotic actor who might figure that out, but there's always more below the surface than you can tell. So in our case, that's true as it ever is, just more so. So like our hope was that that shines through, that you see in this game, there is stuff here that I want to figure out that the game's not telling me or can't tell me. So even if you get it like wrong or different than we had it, it's fine because like as long as you're generally in the right direction, you're getting the tone. Like that was that was we're giving you an experience that we felt like was valuable and interesting. Yeah, I suppose that was kind of the uh, the thought was kind of about how a lot of these kind of little regional stories were, as you said, those, I, I think it was a better way of thinking, it was just boiling it down to one story beat a piece, sort of, and what, mm. interesting. Yeah, uh, I, I guess I'll say, like, it's hard for me to respond to this too, because like, even though we've been at for so long, I try to be respectful of our, of our, like, our secrets, and I'm, I haven't read the wiki in a while, so like, I, I think I would say that the West has like a lot of, one of my examples of like, there's more depth there that I wish we could have gotten forward in like who the boss is and what they're about. Um, that just like you're gonna have to infer it like the player base is like players are never really gonna like totally translate it. But there's something nice about that, that it's left up to your your uh, not imagination, but like your interpretation, your, your brains. Thanks. <laughs> hey, so you mentioned earlier there was the decision with the language that wasn't quite uh, unanimous is handle decisions that <clears throat> there wasn't consensus on. So like a, you guys can suggest, but I'm gonna make the final call. And again, that same vein, like with play tests too, like you said if one in 20, is there like a set threshold that you all had to decide like, we need 100% of people to do this if we're gonna keep it in the game. Mm. Kind of touch and go and see how you feel. Um, um, so let's see, the first question is uh, how did we handle disagreements and like, yeah, did we have like a core system? Now, uh, usually what we had was owners, and this was not like a formal thing, but it was generally understood in the team, uh, that because we were relatively small and there was so much to do, that we each ended up specializing. And so you kind of know who the person is. Um, for the job, like A, who's best at it, but also who, whose baby it is, sort of. Like, um, so, like, uh, Bo spent the most time on weapons. Um, so, for example, like when it came down to how a weapon would ultimately work, like, we generally decided as a team that if there was some really big argument, it would sort of either go to, to Bo um, or to Alex. And that's because, like, Alex was the creator, right? So, like, Alice had a soft amount of trump cards to play of like um, in just like our, like we had a really good relationship as a team, like very, very good. And like the, the times that we really came down to like not being able to agree or to find the best solution were so few. But in those cases it would come down to like the owner. So like Bo was kind of the owner of weapons, but like I spent uh, we, we, we sort of co-owned this, but like I spent a ton of time on the dash and the dash skills and I had really strong opinions about chain dashing, for example. Um, and so, like, I would pick my battle on that and say, like, this is, like, I want this one. Like, so it's like a very bartery sort of soft system. Um, generally, we agreed, and it was a design process. But when it came down to, um, to situations where multiple people really cared, we just had to kind of hash it out as human beings. Like, we didn't have a, we didn't have a law. Um, what was the second part of your question? Oh, when it came to play testing, like, did you? Uh, um, no, like our playtesting was generally more uh, qualitative than quantitative. Like I, I used an example of quantitative earlier by saying like, oh, if one in 20 doesn't get it, then that's not good enough. But um, we didn't have any hard numbers. Like generally what we would do is uh, starting about a, a year into production, we did a week, uh, weekly? Bi-weekly playtests, so every two weeks on Friday, we would meet at um, 
Alex's house, and we would have someone who'd never played the game before come and play a piece of the game. Um, and we'd just all probably, in a way too intimidating way, sit and like watch them. Um, but we like hang out with them and have pizza and stuff, so we try to make it casual. Um, and we usually knew them to some degree, so it wasn't like we were trying to reduce the pressure for them to like tell us the game was good. You know, like you have to be careful about how you mess with people's heads. But um, no, we didn't have we didn't have like a quantitative system. Like the only example that I that again I say is like when I say one in twenty, it's kind of like uh, the it's like the biblical number forty, where forty means a lot. Like um, I just mean like that is a situation where we have to be really ruthless about it. It's kind of like a a general sense. I, I wish that, like, in a perfect world, if we had time and resources to be more quantitative, then yeah, we could have done something like, okay, let's let's run a thousand people through the tutorial and make sure we have stats on it. But ultimately, like, you know, we we got twenty people, twenty thirty play testers in our like very private like end to end beta pre release testing, uh, like a few months before release. Um, so that's the best way to work with. So we couldn't really say one in twenty because like. If you've got 20 people, 1 in 20 isn't like a really accurate statistic, so you can't really be quantitative. You just have to kind of have an idea in your head of how uncompromising you want to be. Thank you. Yeah. So, Playtesting and whatnot, some of the in-game challenges in the game are very difficult. Like uh, in the West, past the 8 module door, there's like that room with all the crystal spikes that you have to get to the end of for one of the outfits, which we still don't know what does, I don't think. <laughs> the other thing, like, the dash arena, 800 consecutive dashes, like, number get decided. How did that come to be? Yeah. Why That's 800? Not... It seems excessive. And... <laughs> <laughs> that was my fault. Um, I got the 799 ones. Oh, that sucks. That's heartbreaking. Um, uh, God. Um, so let's see. Eight hundred is, is not super hard to explain, actually. Um, I wanted a dash challenge in the dash area, and the reason for that was because um, I really liked chain dashing. Like I, I wrote the chain dash code, and like that was like one of my babies that I loved the most. And so like um, I would always like chain dash. For fun, like we would always test to see how many we could get, and like pretty early on, we built like little dev tools to count how many chain dashes you've done. Like, it's just a fun thing. Um, so personally, because I found that to be really entertaining, uh, and because I wanted to see how high players could go, and because a uh, Super Mario RPG has a challenge where like a dude wants you to do Mario's super jump bounce like a hundred or hundred fifty times, like I just wanted an homage to that. Like not a clear homage, but I wanted an homage of like. Let's ask you to do something that's like way hard, super hard, um, to see if you can do it. And so I'll say two things about this. Uh, the number was because uh, in like the first month or two of chain dashing, like the record that I set for the team was like uh, 1,100, um, and I did it during a meeting. Like I was just kind of doing it idly. And I'm a developer, and like you, you can't like I'm the most stickler about this. You cannot judge difficulty as a developer. But I felt like if I can do, if it's only been a couple months and I can do over a thousand while I'm having a conversation, then probably eventually people can do it. Because um, I'm just a human and I'm not really that good at most video games. Uh, so given like enough months of trial or whatever. Uh, 800 came from like, I started at, okay, my world record or my record at the time was like 1100. Um, so I made it a thousand. And then Alex was like, fuck you, get that out of our game, no. And I was like, oh, OK, sorry. Um, how about 800? I was like, I was like, fine, I'm not going to compromise too much, because I think 1,000 is fair, but let's get 800. Um, and 800 is because uh, there's a lot of like the number four in the game. Like there's a, Because the diamond is like the shape of the game, I neurotically decided that in a lot of the code of the game, there's fours. Um, and it ends up in some of the systems, too. Like you collect four gear bits to get one gear. Um, and it's not universal, right? But like a lot of the code has the number four or multiples of four. So I was like, all right, well, 800 is a multiple of like a nice, pretty obvious multiple of four. It's 400 times two. So how about that? That's like, I'll give you 800. Um, so that's how the specific number came to be. Um, 
And, and like, my other response to like why it's so hard is that uh, I always compare this to like a math, a, a computer science teacher I had in college who would um, design the tests so that the average student would get a fifty percent. And the teacher's philosophy was the way that most courses are, or many courses are designed. It's like because of the way that grading works and because of the way that like companies hire and the GPAs they expect, like the average students are getting like somewhere in the like well, I don't know, 80s in the 80th percentile. So like your average, your 50% is at 80%, like you're you're maladjusted. And so so what he would do is like design a test for 50%, which is a failing grade, and then curve accordingly, but it, it gave him the biggest possible uh, range of successes. Because he could see, oh, if you get a hundred percent on this, then you're really good at this. Um, and that's what I wanted. I wanted something that was like, um, most people are not going to be able to get this. I, I was like, okay with that personally. And and this is coming from someone who, in the main game, I was a stickler for, I want people to be able to play this. I want it to be easier. Like, I was not the biggest advocate for difficulty. Um, I'm not a hardcore gamer, really. Like, I, I'm not as good at games as, like, say, Alex is. Alex gets really into, like, Dark Souls and, and like, beats those games, and I super don't. So I actually don't like games being too hard. But in this case, what I, um, it's just like my personal value is like, uh, if you really want to 100% everything, then like, we're going to make you work for it because we're not asking you to 100% everything. It's like a language, right? Like, we're expecting that people aren't going to figure that out. So we're not going to punish you for not knowing it. So we're not punishing you for not knowing the dash. It's just my opinion that like, uh, I call it like difficulty entitlement when some people got like, some people in the Steam forums got like actually mad about it. And I was like, usually my response on the internet is like, if someone's like, this is too hard. I'm like, I believe in you. Like I swear you can do this, and you can, right? Like you can. It's just going to be uh, painful emotionally and, and physically. So sorry. <laughs> but if you do it, you feel awesome. Like mo most people who beat it, like send me a photo of it. They're like, oh my god, I'm like, yes. Like you are so good at this. I I think you're so good at this because that's still kind of hard for me. What's the highest number you've seen? I think I saw like 1,600. Um, that's hard to judge because I, I wish that I had better uh, tracking on this because like um, you can do it with the mouse and keyboard, which is significantly easier than doing it with the controller. So I like care less about the mouse and keyboard ones because that's just like how insane are you? Like I, I've seen, I don't remember the number, but I've seen some absurd number that was probably higher than 1,600 for mouse and keyboard, but I file it away under like doesn't count. Person. Um, controller, I think, yeah, like some something like nothing in the two thousands. I've seen something like fourteen to sixteen hundred. I've never gotten fourteen to sixteen hundred from that. So cool. Well uh, I think we're about out of time for tonight. But uh, thank you so much, Teddy. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thanks for the questions. It was fun. So thank you. Um, this has been our Run Jump Dev December monthly meeting with our guest, Teddy Deef. Uh, if you'd like to find more information about us, we are Run Jump Dev, Lexington's game development group. Uh, we have a meetup page. We have social media. We have runjumpdev.org, which is our website. And you can find out about our events as they come up there. Very um, real conference and then a consumer facing show, Lex Play, that we just put on and, and we're not thinking about right now. Um, <laughs> That. There's quite a bit into that. Uh, and you have the Global Game Jam coming up January 20th through the 22nd. Um, and that will be right here at the campus. Uh, and uh, Teddy, uh, where can we find you online? What's Where's your stuff? Um, uh, easiest place to find me is on Twitter if you actually want to like talk to me or, or follow my daily whatever. It's uh, Teddy Deef, T-E-D-D-Y-D-I-E-F. That's on Twitter. Uh, if there's any, what, what else? That's that's kind of it. I, I this TeddyDeef.com has like my main work if you want to see it. Um, but yeah, just hang out on Twitter. That works for me. Cool. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye.